Well, hello, this is Dr. Jay Smith on The Jay Show, and it's so good to be back again here in London. It's so good to be taking on issues that are important to us. We are actually going to segue into some brand new issues that we've never uh, really engaged with, that we've never unpacked before, and to do that, we've got a real special guest. This is my good friend, Alan Craig. Good to be with you, Jay. Really Boy, I love your voice. You've got a real speaker's voice. Have I? <laughs> you have, and you've got the presence, and you've got the background, and you've certainly got the experience. Now, Alan, not everybody knows you. You're well known here in England and in Britain. Can you say a little bit about yourself? Go ahead and tell us what's your background, and why is it that you are the person to talk about these social and political issues and theological, probably better than anybody else I know. Um, and don't be humble. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm humble or not, Joe, Jay. Um, well, I, I, I've lived uh, the last 30, 35 years of my life in the East End of London, which is a very diverse, poor area of London, although it's changing and being regenerated. Uh, Explain uh, more what East End. Now, I know what East End, but most of the people who are watching don't know why that's significant. Um, it's the... It's the poor end of most cities, actually, the East End is, uh, and it certainly is in, in London. Uh, but it's also the area where immigrants predominantly have come to. Uh, and what kind of immigrants, specifically? Uh, all sorts now, all sorts, but particularly those from South Asia, uh, which is Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. So, uh, pr primarily Muslims? Primarily Muslim. Um, and indeed, the area where I live is, is, is majority Muslim. Okay. Uh, so. And you have been engaging with Muslims for quite a few years, particularly in one area. What's the area that you are best known for? Um, I ran a campaign against what was then known as the Olympic Mega Mosque. There were plans to build a huge, something like 40,000 capacity mosque right beside the Olympic Stadium in time for the 2012 London Olympics. Mm, that's right. And it happens to be about a mile from where I live. And uh, I started a campaign in 2005, 2006, started a campaign to stop that particular mosque. I'm not against mosques in principle uh, because I believe in freedom of, uh, freedom of religion. Uh, but you do this, believe in freedom of, of course, information and freedom of speech, freedom of information too. You well, yeah. to say that, but those all are things that you have are... are yeah, it's, it's really important. But, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and, of course, when I started opposing this mosque, people said, oh, you know, you're Islamophobic and you want to close down mosques and all this sort of thing. You're a Christian fundamentalist, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And I, I So said, there was so, the name-calling that went. We're yeah, going to talk uh, about that in another episode because uh, that's a real problem now, isn't the, it? The name-calling was huge when I started, absolutely huge. As, as much from sort of the hard left English uh, and Brits as from Muslims. Yeah, um, yeah. It was quite horrendous when I started. Um, but I, I made up my mind right the way through that um, I was against this particular project. I'm not against Muslims as people, and I'm not against mosques in principle. You know, I mean, as I say, freedom of religion. But this particular one was massive, and it was proposed by a very fundamentalist group, a very separatist group called Tablighi Jamaat. And I could see the social consequences of building this mosque would be horrendous. I mean, they, they teach that if you want to be a good Muslim, you have minimum contact with the kuffar, with the non-Muslims. That's what they teach. It's a very fundamentalist form of Islam. And to have a massive, great platform in the middle of the East End propagating that separatism is bad for social cohesion and bad for integration and so on. The, the so that, that, that Jamaat, for those who don't know, was begun in the 1920s, uh, and that has grown and grown. It's, uh, they say now numbers, 80 million members, and it's in 120 countries. That's right, they, yeah, yeah. They have their, their, uh, they have their, their, their seminaries in Dewsbury, which is up in northern England, so they have an enormous number of people right here, a lot of them in the area where you live. Yeah, they, they're the most successful uh, Muslim missionary group in the world, yeah, uh, bar none. It's Muhammad uh, Ilyas. That's the man. Ilyas, the guy. That's the guy. Yes, indeed. That mosque it reminds me. Of that mosque some years ago. Now that mosque was uh, named after him as well. Um, uh, but they're massive. They're very below the radar. They don't seek publicity. They just go out doing their um, uh, uh, proselytism. Um, they have already have a huge mosque up, as you say, up in in Savile Town in Dewsbury in the north north of England. And that's their European headquarters. And that's got a capacity, I think, of about 4,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to have this as one of their three global centers. Uh, the other one was back in Delhi, as you say, area called Mawat, just outside Delhi. Uh, and their third one was to be in Saudi, in Mecca. 
They want to have these three global centers. Strategically placed yep. when you stop and think because Mecca would be the center of Islam. And then, of course, India, Delhi, is the second largest. Yeah, I, did you know this? It's the second largest Muslim country. It has surpassed Pakistan in numbers, Muslim numbers. Really? Well, oh, you don't think of that because you think of India as being Hindu, Hindu 800 right. million, yeah. 200 million Muslims. Yeah. That's strategic because it's right at the center of the largest block of Muslims in the world. If you take Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, add their Muslim populations, you get upwards of 600 million just there. And then, of course, London. This is where 70% of all Muslims come from those three countries that are, 70% uh, of all Muslims in Britain come from those three countries. Absolutely, yeah. This yeah. is the stepping stone for Europe and for the West. West. That's absolutely. It was, it, was, it was to be the sort of Western headquarters, more than just the European Western yeah. headquarters, the Western headquarters here in London. So strategic that you confronted it. Now, in my eyes, Alan, you're one of my heroes because <laughs> single-handedly you actually stopped that mosque and you have been given awards for this. Yeah. Uh, I know you don't like to talk about it, <laughs> and I know I'm pushing you in a place that you feel uncomfortable. Well, I don't, I'm very happy to talk about it, because I am. Uh, I, it, it, it looks single-handed, because I, but I had a, a small team with me. Yes, but yeah. you were the one that was on television. You were the one that was being baited. You were the one that was getting attacked. You were the one that all the reporters were lambasting. No other name was there but yours. My name wasn't there. I helped you out once in a while. Other people's name wasn't Jay, there. It was really <laughs> Alan Craig. <laughs> if we're scratching my mother's back, Jay, you helped me enormously, because you taught me about, all about Islam. When I started the project, I hardly knew anything about Islam. It's by coming and sitting, listening to you, and seeing you at but the, at being the public corner. figure, so. being the man that so. took on, it was like a David and Goliath. Everybody that talks about it, it was a David and Goliath type of environment because you were up against a, such an enormous, not just the fact that you were up against an enormous group that re represented 80 million, it was also the, 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 the Eu European, I mean, the British uh, consortiums that they were paying to do their PR for them. You were up against these huge PR forms as well. Yes, we had a huge problem with them. I mean, it was it, it, it was an absolutely fascinating campaign. It started in 2005 and really finished, uh, finally finished maybe three years ago. So 2016, 2017, yeah. it went right, right way through. It was rejected at all sorts of levels, right up to the government, up to the High Court. They kept appealing and appealing for planning permission. So it finally finished. And it was a tremendous campaign. I really enjoyed it. But this David and Goliath thing was quite deliberate. I thought, actually, uh, in the context of the UK, if, uh, as a, a white Brit, you know, was busy condemning an ethnic minority uh, project, uh, it could it could look quite sort of racist and so on. Brilliant, but what was your key line? What was your tag line? Go ahead and tell. What is it that you used that turned everybody's attention and realized? Uh, that when, and I loved it when, when you were there in Newham Council and you said, look at the, what they're saying. They're saying really isolation. Yeah, that, Do you that really want, and you said, is this what we need for Britain? Another group that's even more isolated? Yeah, I didn't. I mean, people said, oh, well, they clearly got terror. Um, the, the French um, intelligence services decided that uh, Tabihi Jamat was a route into, uh, into terrorism, and, you know, extremism and so on. Well, so young men joined. Three of the four yeah. men that exploded those bombs Absolutely. on 2005 yeah. were Tabihi Jamat yeah, here yeah. in London, yeah. killed 52 people. Yeah. So they are, there is that side of them. We, they don't like to be known for that. And I'm not going to say that they're all that way. Yeah. No one would dare say that. Yeah. But there is the teaching. If you're going to go back to the prophet as their example, and you're going to go back to the Quran, as your example, you're going to come away with the same kind of teaching, regardless. We've been saying, I've been saying that for 37 <laughs> years. I do quite right. That's true. But they're not a terrorist organization no, themselves. That's quite clear. They, they say they're peaceful and they are peaceful and they, they're, they're quite pietistic and, and so on. But it's this, uh, this social isolation that they teach which that's will be it. so harmful. And that's what I kept banging on about, kept banging on about. And it was really quite satisfying, really. In my, my own, the local authority in my own area, known as Newham, they started up 100% in favor of the mosque. They thought it was, it'd be fantastic to have this big, iconic, beautiful mosque in the middle of Newham. It'd be a little prestige project. That's where they were back in 2004, 2005. And the whole, the local authority, the planning authority and so on, all thought it was a great idea. Um, but I just kept banging on about, do you know what you're letting yourself in for? Do you know what you're letting... And I would quote Muslim sources about Tablighi Jamaat. You know, Muslim sources are quite hostile to, to Tablighi Jamaat. In fact, you got so, some Muslims on side with Absolutely, you. I worked with them. And, I worked you, with them. and yeah, they actually went to. public with you, didn't yeah, they? they did. And one of the great things was um, a, 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 a group of Barelwi uh, Muslims in Newham ran a petition 
against this mosque. I got to know them very well because for those of you who don't family. know what he's talking about, you have the Bareilly group, then you have the Deobandis uh, in amongst the Indians, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Those are the two major groups. They're both Sunni, but they one is much the Bareilly are much more Sufi oriented. The Deobandis are much we would call more Salafi. Yeah, that's uh, right. They're much more uh, orthodox yeah, in their yeah, in their beliefs yeah, yeah. and their practices. And. Uh, yeah, they were. So I, I, I got to know them quite well. There aren't as many Borelli in Newham as there are the Diabandi and, and so on. But I got to know them quite well and worked with them. And they ran this campaign. They really didn't want this mosque. Our perspectives were different. I mean, I, just, I wanted the mosque stopped. I thought it was completely inappropriate. The Borelwis would have been happy if it hadn't been just to be Hijabat Mosque. They wanted more... Uh, comprehensive Muslim mosque is what yeah. they wanted. But and nonetheless, they ran a, a petition against the mosque. I worked well with them, and uh, and I was very happy to do so. I'm not against Muslims, uh, yeah. but I was against this project. Yeah, and th this proves it. The yeah. fact that you were there alongside Muslims, yeah. they were with you. This is not an anti-Muslim. And well, fact I'm, my, whole, my whole thing is I want to differentiate between the project, which was unacceptable, and the people. And when I started the campaign, the first thing I did was I, I knew the project manager. He lived about a mile from me and knew him. I knew him. I got to know him socially before the project started. So I phoned him up and I said, I've, I've been studying your project. I've been looking at this back in 2006. I've been studying your project. I don't like what I see, but I'd like to come and meet with the elders because I've got a, a series of questions for them. I yeah. had a whole list of questions I want to ask them about it. I said, I don't want to go public on the thing until I actually talk to you about it. In other words, I was reaching out. I won't say it's a right hand of friendship, but I certainly want to be deal on a person to person basis. So I phoned him up and I said, uh, can I come and see your elders and talk? I want to, um, here are my concerns about your project. I'd like to put them to you. Um, and he had been, when I'd previously met him, he'd been very friendly, very sociable. We met in various social circumstances and so on and knew him. Uh, suddenly the whole thing went icy. He said, no, I don't think that'd be a good idea, Alan. I don't think it'd be good to do. I said, but I'd like to, you know, I mean, uh, I'd like to come and put my concerns to you. Why not? Yeah. He said, no, I don't think it'd be appropriate. He said two or three times, I don't think it'd be appropriate. I said, fine, but remember, I'm available any time, okay? You can phone me any time. If you see me say things which you don't like, you can phone me up any time. So we didn't talk, and then I, I went public with my concerns, and yeah. it just took off. Brilliant. The BBC got hold of it, and all sorts of other programs got hold of it, and suddenly, uh, suddenly, <laughs> Suddenly I found I was being interviewed uh, uh, by, by, by uh, New York Times, had a long article on it, Finnish radio and German TV and Australian, uh, all the media around the world were watching it. Not cause of, just because of the project, but because it was right next door to the upcoming uh, uh, Olympic, Olympic Stadium. Stadium yeah. They were about half a mile apart. Yeah, so it would have been. Yeah. Now, this, is, this whole idea of working with Muslims, like you say, you did, this is very I'm going to segue from that into something that's more recent now that you're very concerned about. And, and this is the teaching of LGBTism in, in primary schools. Uh, and now, one of the things that you're concerned about is that the, uh, this sexualizing of children at such, such a young age, you have children, they're in school, is not only a concern that Christians have, but it's a concern that Muslims have. Now, can, bring us up to speed on what you, what's coming up, what, what you've noticed. Uh, the article that you sent me was very revealing about this one school in Birmingham where the parents are actually uh, taking it upon themselves to get this stopped. What's this all about? Where, why should we be concerned? Uh, in Birmingham uh, in particular, but also up and down the country, in Birmingham in particular, there's a real drive, and has been for some years, to <coughs> teach children about homosexuality. Now, it's all part of what I see as the sexualization of our children. Bear in mind what we're talking about all the time, this is really important. We're not talking about young, young people. We're talking about primary school children, which in the UK is up to the age of 10. So we're talking about overwhelmingly prepubescent children. Right. That's okay, so that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about 15, 16, 18 year old uh, young people. We're talking These about are impressionable kids. These are impressionable kids. This will be kids the first who, things they hear about sexuality. In no, they don't, they're not concerned at that age about sex. Never heard of it. Well, they just want to get away playing or whatever they want to do. You know that. I know. You've had kids. I've had kids. Right. We, we know what it's like. Okay. But in particular in Birmingham, for some years now, there's been a drive by educationists there to promote uh, the LGBT agenda. Uh, originally, they had a, 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 a campaign called Challenging Homophobia in Primary School. Now wrap your mind around that. Challenging homophobia in primary schools. What homophobia are you going to get in a primary school? Right. <laughs> you know, if you're going to get any, any sort of bullying or anything like that, it's going to be appearance bullying or anything like that, and teachers need to deal with it. But uh, they decided homophobia in primary school. And it's just a way 
of explaining to kids what homosexuality is about and beginning to normalise homosexuality. But it's more than that, it's worse than that. Uh, well, let me, let me, I'll come on to what, how it's worse than that, but what is, the, the latest thing to happen is some weeks ago, early part of this year, there was a primary school called Parkville Primary School, which is predominantly Muslim, in an area of Birmingham. And the parents were aware of the teaching which was being promoted then by the uh, deputy head, who himself was gay, and he was teaching the latest development of this uh, challenging homophobia in primary school, uh, CHIPS. Okay, and the latest thing is, is something called Educate and Celebrate, or, and, 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 well, it has various names, it does. But he's promoting this agenda to those children in this school. And the predominantly Muslim parents decided they'd had enough, and they started taking their children out of school. And this has now been going on for some time. It's spread to other schools as well, a school called, uh, and, and, what's it called? Anderton, Anderton Primary School. Um, they've had their children out there for eight weeks. They go into school and then the parents take them out for the for And the you're talking lessons. about 80% of the population of the school are these children. So this is not just a sig insignificant number. This is the majority of the students yeah. are now being pulled out of school. Yeah. Not for the entire days, but certain parts of the days yeah. in protest. Yeah. And the parents are outside, peaceably protesting outside. So, um, uh, leave our kids alone and, you know, and those sort of banners are held out there. And the parents are Muslim and Christian, am I, am I correct? There are some Christian, but overwhelmingly Muslim. Some Christians have gone and joined, but generally the, the Christians, and especially the church, um, has been very quiet about the whole thing. Uh, but you haven't. Well, I mean, my position all the way through is there shouldn't be sex education, gay or straight, in primary schools. It's completely inappropriate. Yeah. It's just all part of the desire to sexualize our children. But it's worse. What the, these? You know, God bless these Muslim parents. They've taken their children out. They still campaign, and 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 they're still, you know, even today they'll have their children out of school, around there. It's spread to other schools as well, and they're standing their ground. And of course, they come under a lot of stick. Uh, from uh, LGBT areas and the Department of Education and head teachers and all the rest of it, all who bought into this sort of liberal uh, uh, mindset of teaching kids about sex. Um, but they're standing their ground, and I say, you know, God bless them, well done. And they, they're exposing. What you do see is that uh, they don't see it in these terms. They just don't quite rightly, they don't, they don't want their, their little, their, their, their children uh, taught about the LGBT issues. But you start looking into it behind it. The people in Birmingham, the LGBT people who are campaigning in Birmingham, have a website. You could see it yourself. You could look it up here if you want to, on there. It's called Educate and Celebrate. And in there, they say quite simply that their objective is to smash heteronormativity. Okay? They want to smash heteronormativity in primary schools. That's their agenda. So they explain it. They put it forward, we need to be a tolerant society, of course, and we need to... <laughs> it doesn't sound too tolerant, well, does it? Well, exactly. This is, this is, this is the ugliness <laughs> of the agenda behind it. But what they're teaching, they're saying, all our children... It is in, this is the 21st century, this is their line. This is the 21st century, and it's quite likely that um, the children, some of the children at school will have two mummies or two daddies back at home, and the rest of the children must know... You know that's, that's how their poster to. has a Muslim girl with a hijab and, I assume, and a white boy with the LGBT flag between them, holding them up, celebrating as if Muslims are all alongside them. <laughs> Have they not been reading the news? <laughs> they're, I mean, they're that's in an oxymoron. The news, that's, a, okay. that's just poor advertisement right there. Well, that's false advertisement. But Fascinating. It's, what, it's, it's what they do. They, they use these fig leaf words. And listen, listen to this. Well, I've had, I was arguing this on the, on the radio the other day, and, and they said, well, but Mr. Craig, surely it's entirely reasonable. We live in the 21st century. Surely we not want our children to understand that there are different forms of family back at home. Uh, and not everybody just has a mum and dad back at home. So we must teach our children to be tolerant. But you realise this is all just a way of, of teaching them about homosexuality. You know, the name is on the tin, homosexuality. You know, that's what they teach them about. Because... Deep down, and you can see it on the website, they want to smash heteronormativity. That's what it's about. And the Muslims who are taking their children out of school, of course, know nothing about this. They just don't want their children taught this. But you start digging around behind it, think, God, oh, this, is, this is really what it's all about. We all know it. But this is, so they have these nice, smooth, tolerant, 21st century words which make it all quite reasonable. And parents that take their children out are unreasonable. 
but dig around behind and you see these words, these smooth words are just yeah. a fig leaf yeah. to cover up what's going on behind. Okay. So God bless these parents. I hope more of them. I hope, I hope it spreads across the country. Yeah. I'd like to see non-Muslims much more involved as well. If you were to look in the Quran and you were to go to chapter 4, verse 16, Surah 4, Ayah 16, to chapter 7, verse 80 to 84, that's Surah 7, Ayah 80 to 84. If you go to chapter 27, verse 55, those three, there's a few others, are very clear that the Quran and Allah is against homosexuality. I mean, the Quran is very clear it is against homosexuality. For any Muslim, if this is the word, their word of God, uh, then they would have to follow what their Quran says. So it's clear that they're actually being consistent to their text. You can see how that's going to, that, that nobody, uh, people who are not of faith will not understand the power of Scripture. We understand that because we also have the Bible, and uh, Romans 1 is very clear that men, is not, men are not to lay with men. So we both go back to a text, a scripture. We are scripture people. You belong to this text. I belong, I belong to this text. But the Muslims we're talking about belong to this text. Both of them are very clear that this is an aberration. But it's also, what's fascinating, this text tells us that though it's an aberration, that's not something that people in the kingdom are to do. Outside of the kingdom, they have all the right to do so. We don't impose that on them. We're not about to propose. We don't want to impose sexuality or sexual norms on anybody else. But here, what you're telling me, they're imposing their sexual norms on us. The very thing they're claiming we're, that we're doing when we're not yeah. is what they are actually doing under the cover. That's fascinating to me that the roles have been reversed now. It is always, well, this is the, this is the new uh, official morality. It is a new... Puritanism, it's a new orthodoxy which they're now going to impose on everybody. You've all got to believe in this, known as tolerance, that's how they were, they use it. But deep down, it's actually imposing their values on everybody else. And you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Jay, it's, it's a key thing for us as Christians. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't mind what two men do in bed. It's none of my business what they do in bed. But what I do know is within the kingdom, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, no, you, right. do, you do not participate. If you're a believer, you do not participate in sex outside marriage. That's right. <laughs> okay, whatever sort of sex. And, and that's, that's just so, for those of us who claim Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Absolutely. So, so and I'm the not, Muslims, for them, they claim Muhammad is their prophet, Allah is their God. They also have that same stricture. Now, to be fair, there are many Muslims that believe this is for everybody. And that is one of the things that is one of the things that we do not like about Islam. But for Christians, we would never impose this. Yet the, this is very much an imposition. The fact that this deputy head is not going to, even though all this protest has gone on, he has refused to acquiesce on this point. They're going to go ahead and still teach it, mm. though they may not have any school left. Mm. Can you yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. To, to me, that sounds that sounds like everything that I've heard. Uh, the, uh, atheists and humanists, what they hate most about Christianity is that we're imposing our morality on others. We're not this uh, but, anymore. But, but it's interesting, the line that many of those that uh, propose and agree with the LGBT agenda, they object to what the Muslim parents are doing because they're saying they are imposing Sharia law on the school. That's their line. Oh, they, these Muslims are imposing Sharia law. I, my argument to that is these parents are not imposing Sharia law. They're quite simply trying to protect the innocence of their children, with which I agree. But it's an argument that those that are against the Muslim parents argue. And that's they say, there we go, this is more Sharia law coming to the UK. And it's quite interesting one of that to argue. So would you suggest then that Christians get behind this protest and start actually standing shoulder to shoulder with Muslims? Would yeah, you suggest yeah, we do yeah, that? Yeah, I would. Absolutely, I would. Yeah. I, I don't see it as Sharia law. I mean, uh, you, if you want to, you can say everything a Muslim does is part of Sharia law, because in some level it is. But uh, uh, I don't think it's helpful just to see it in those ideological terms. It I would help also the public if there were Christians there, because we're not promoting Sharia law. Sharia law. Yeah, but we are promoting healthy uh, a, a, a healthy atmosphere for our kids yeah. that is not imposing at such a young age, but even at any age, I don't want LGBTism to impo be imposed on me as an adult. I don't want it to be imposed on me. Yeah. I don't want anything to be imposed on me. One of the things that gets me angriest about Muslims is when they came to Harrow, and I used to go to my subway shop, and I used to get ham there. And then they said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna eat there until you take ham out of there, even though they hardly, it was a Hindu shop. And the ham was lost, and I lost my ham, and I got upset. I said, if, if you don't want ham, then eat another, eat another goat. There's lots of other things you can eat here. The Hindus who are serving us don't eat any meat. They don't impose their views on us. And now we see here this LGBTism uh, is being imposed on us. 
even against but, what we believe it, but, and against what our scripture says and uh, what kids should be even listening to. We could open up a whole lot wider arena of non-LGBT issues, how the dominant liberal authoritarianism that we have in this country is imposing its views on absolutely everywhere. And if you don't agree with it, you could be Islamophobic, it would be another one that's interesting in the light of this particular one, or you can be homophobic or a transphobic. They close down discussion of anything that they don't want. And they, the, the mainstream, the central dominant mainstream liberal authoritarian discourse is on closing down everybody else who doesn't agree with them. You have such a rich voice, you have such a great stature, you have such a presence about you. You're like the, 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 uh, the quintessential English gentleman, you might say. <laughs> and because of the fact that you carried such stature, people did listen. And I think because you may remain consistent through all these years, going through the Olympic mosque, and man managed to finally get in it. In fact, there is no Olympic mosque now. No. Is there even a mosque, period? There's a, a temporary, some temporary shed still there, but since then, I mean, the, uh, 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 talk about the causing confusion, Tablighi Jamat on that site has now split. They had rows, internal rows, which we believe was about this, because not everybody in Tbilisi map wanted this huge, great mosque. Uh, so we think it was something to do with it. May, no doubt there are other issues as well, but anyway, they've split, so half of them have gone off to, they, they worship and, and do their prayers in a, somewhere else in another mosque in, in uh, Tower Hamlet. Which yeah. tells me that it, all it takes is one. All it takes is one person in this case, Alan Craig, to stand up against 80 million. Now, I know I'm, I'm using hyperbole there, but there, there is a truth to that. You, one person with your little team around you, and I remember your team didn't, some, didn't have didn't a measure to more than 10 at a time. Uh, we would go leafleting with you into all the doorways, but you were the one that was the face of it. You were the one that was on television. You were the one that was getting all the ha harassment. You were the one that they were, uh, the, whose name was public and, and very I, personal. I was the one that first opposed it. I remember, I absolutely yeah. remember just doing it. I was quite surprised because uh, I issued a, pre after I'd had this discussion I was mentioning earlier and that with, the, with the project manager and I said to him, you know, I'd really like to meet your elders and come and express my concerns that you wouldn't yeah. meet. So I then issued a press release. I put out a press release and just said, um, these are my concerns. I think this whole thing is being bulldozed through by the secular authorities uh, who are approving of it. And this is completely inappropriate. And suddenly, uh, because it was closely associated with the Olympic Stadium, just which was being built just down the road, suddenly it took off, and yeah. suddenly I was, and and, and so you I, I became the I became the mouthpiece, and I was the one that first stood there and said, "We're not having this. It's yeah. inappropriate." I live here, my kid, bring up my kids here, and we don't want this great monstrosity, uh, uh, the, uh, this great totem to separatism that they're trying to build here. So and now you have another big monstrosity that's raising its head: LGBTism. So just as you were able to do one. You're probably the best located, uh, really, to look at, the, look at the people and just talk to the people now who are watching and just say, what can they do as we wrap this up? Give them about maybe 30 seconds. What would you say they can do to stop LGBTism, this sexualization that's going on for our primary kids? I would say first thing to do is uh, grab together your courage. Get your courage together. Um, it is difficult. I know from... Uh, when I oppose we, uh, gay marriage in, in, uh, in our country here, uh, I opposed it then, the uh, vitriol and the aggression you receive for doing so from the LGBT lobby is horrendous, absolutely horrendous. So you first have to be strong about it and then you have to look at your children and think actually your children's innocence and the way you bring up your children, and we're talking about primary school children here, the way you bring them up is really, really important. And then act on it. So act on it. If you have children at school, consider taking them out of school if they're being taught this sort of uh, stuff. And also uh, be willing to stand up and speak up against it elsewhere. It is very, very difficult. Uh, LGBT now dominate all the political discourse in, in our society anyway. Um, well, supposed to stand up and speak up against it. It takes real courage. It takes courage. I may say it takes more courage than it did to stand up against the, the Mega Mosque. The well, Mega Mosque was a, a, Alan, a, we appreciate you with that. I'm so glad you've come on the show. God bless you. This is Jay here on the Jay Show. It's been great to have Alan Craig. Stay tuned. We're going to talk about some more issues. This is Jay then. Over and out.